Hi, good afternoon and welcome to Cowside Cafe. My name is Nadia Kareem and I will be your host today. This event is brought to you by the Office of the Vice President for Research. Now today we're going to talk about statistics for solutions in science and I don't know about our listeners but I hated statistics when I was in school and even in college. And then when I got into my PhD and I realized that I actually needed statistics and needed to fully understand how to do it, I probably still didn't put enough pass on how important statistics are for real world issues. But with COVID-19 this year, when I think every government's chief medical officer conveyed the message of infected COVID-19 persons, we all heard the OR number enough times, this reproduction number. And I think now every nation has realized how important statistics truly are. So today we're gonna to hear some interesting insights in how, in how statistics are used for solutions in science. And I'm joined by three CAIS faculty from our statistics department. I'm definitely going to say statistics wrong a couple of times today. Welcome everyone. How are you all doing today? Very well, thank you, Nadia. Good, you are almost welcome here today. Um, so I think we'll start off with a couple of introductions. Uh, Hernando, you seem pretty eager there. If you could introduce yourself and tell us exactly what you do at KAIST and um, especially with regard to statistics. Well, my name is uh, Hernando Ombal and I'm a professor in the statistics program here at KAIST. Um, I received my PhD degree from the University of Michigan and I joined KAIST about uh, uh, three, three years ago. And my work is on time series, um, time series analysis, which is really roughly the recordings um, at many different points in space over, over a range of, of time period. Hi, so when you say um, time series, what exactly is a time series, especially when you think of a brain? Yes, so um, for example, we think about uh, brain signals like electroencephalograms where uh, we attach electrodes on the scalp. So there are many points on the scalp where we have these electrodes. And over time, we record electrical signals of, of coming from the brain. So these are signals recorded every, every millisecond uh, um, over the course of uh, a few minutes or maybe even uh, uh, hours in some cases. Brilliant. And so then these time series, where are they, where, where could you kind of, where are they applicable to? Is it, you know, different diseases? Are you working with Alzheimer's disease? Yeah. So one of the exciting things about being a statistician is that it allows you to learn about the mathematics, about the statistics, about computing, and really be able to apply this to real life problems. And so in my, in my own work, in the work of my students here at Kaos, we're interested in studying um, uh, um, brain functional connectivity. So very roughly, we're looking at how different parts of the brain may influence other parts of the brain. Uh, and so we use time series concepts uh, uh, in, that, uh, uh, in these kind of applications. Excellent. So time series is like almost an indirect measurement for these diseases, these human diseases. Correct. Yes. So by looking at these brain signals, looking at these time series, then we're able to identify what separates, let's say, a healthy individual from an individual with some mental disease. So we, look, we use time series to look at brain connectivity. So for some groups of people, uh, they may have stronger or weaker dependencies or connectivities between, uh, between specific uh, pairs of regions of the brain. Brilliant. I think, you know, coming from um, a biology background myself, I never, and no offense here, but I never thought that perhaps um, statistics would be, you know, so involved in, let's say, human diseases in that respect and understanding the differences between a healthy individual and um, an unhealthy individual. So very interesting. Um, Paula, if I hand it over to you next, introduce yourself, tell us exactly what you do here at KAIST because you're pretty new to KAIST, right? Yeah, yes. Uh, hello, my name is Paula Moraga and I'm an assistant professor of statistics at KAUST and the principal investigator of the geospatial statistics and health surveillance research group. My research focuses on the development of statistical methods and computational tools for geospatial data analysis and health surveillance. I have developed methods to understand the spatial and spatial temporal patterns of diseases and identifying risk factors of diseases such as malaria in Africa, leptospirosis in Brazil, and cancer in Australia. 
I also develop a statistical software, so my methods can be widely available and provide benefits beyond my own applications. And I'm the author of several statistical packages for disease mapping, detection of clusters, and risk assessment of travel-related spread of disease. Very impressive. Thank you, Paula. And when we're talking about geospatial, we're talking about a region or an area where perhaps the disease is, right? Yes, that, that's correct. So we have information about individuals with disease and we have the locations of the people living like where they live or sometimes for confidentiality reasons, we have aggregated data in municipalities or counties and we are able to, to identify high risk areas. And you've even then worked on um, the virus that everybody knows the name of around the world, COVID-19 this year too, right? And the different locations in which, where you can find it. Yes, so before coming to Caust, I was collaborating with professors Hernando Mbao, David Ketchenson and Carlos Duarte on projects related to COVID-19 response. In one of the projects, we assessed the severity of COVID-19 by age and gender, which is very important to plan health resources. And in other projects, we developed a mathematical model to quantify the effect of interventions such as lockdowns and social distancing measures that prevented millions of deaths uh, globally. Thank you, Paula. And I think it just shows how important statistics really is and you statisticians, oh, statisticians as well. Oh my God, I'm gonna be rolling over this word too much in the next hour. Um, how important you really are. So thank you for that. David, if you'd like to introduce yourself and tell us exactly what you do here at KAUST. Right, uh, yes, my name is David Bolin and I'm an associate professor uh, of statistics and the PI of the Stochastic Processes and Applied Statistics uh, Research Group here at KAUST. Um, so I joined KAUST about a year ago now. Uh, and before that, uh, I was at, uh, a fa faculty member at Chalmers University of Technology and the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. And my main research interest is in development of methodology and statistical models for problems uh, where we have data collected uh, at different spatial locations, like Paula was mentioning, uh, but also possibly then collected over different points in time. Uh, and I mainly work on uh, statistical methods that are based on uh, so-called stochastic partial differential equations, uh, which are equations that are often used in physics, for instance, but where we have some additional randomness to make these models uh, useful also in statistics. And this is a quite, uh, it's quite exciting research area where we can apply or method from both statistics and applied mathematics to construct more flexible statistical models and better computational methods for, uh, for statistical inference. Brilliant, thank you, David. Um, I don't know if I'd put the word exciting and statistics together, but we still have definitely 45 minutes to go through this. So I, I think at the end of it, I, would, <laughs> I will be thinking that they are very interesting and exciting. So let me just get a grasp on exactly what you do. There, there's the statistics side of it, and there's also the applied mathematics side of it. And we, the reason for this is that we need to apply flexible models because you are gathering so much data. And with understanding big data for um, you know, different, where, whether it be um, problems like diseases or environmental sciences, so brain imaging, as you said, or air pollution, we would need to apply a very big model in order to be accurate um, with, your, with, with, with the statistics. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. So, uh, I mean, this is also in, in my group, we also work a lot with, with applications in, in particular in, in environmental sciences in, and also in brain imaging. And as you said, the, the reason for these particular areas is because we often then, when we have both data over space and time, we typically get very big data sets and then we need both efficient computational methods, but uh, also flexible uh, models. So. 
Excellent, thank you. And just for our listeners as well, just a small reminder that you can submit your questions, so please do so, and then our panellists will get to them um, towards the end. So um, for me, I'd really like to know exactly what got you excited about using statistics to solve problems in science, because there's a lot of stories out there where you hear of individuals going in, you know, to, you know, they want to solve um, cancer and they want to understand heart disease a little bit more. Statistics, I want to understand that a little bit better. Hernando, what got you excited about using statistics to solve problems in science? Yeah, so I think statistics is really a, um, a language in which we can, a formal language to be able to tell a story. So if you think about, let's say uh, you're in an experiment, you're watching a movie, and while you're watching a movie, your brain signals are being recorded. And of course, you're watching different scenes, listening to different sounds. And uh, so statistics allows you to formalize uh, how you, how you uh, define brain activation, how you define connectivity between regions, between brain, as, 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 you watch, as you watch a movie. And moreover, it also allows you to see how your brain responds to the stimulus, how that varies across different individuals. And every person has his own experience. And therefore, that factors into how they respond to to these kinds of stimuli. Yeah, so um, uh, this is how I got excited in statistics because I, I, when I first came to the United States, I wanted to study insurance, math, actuarial science. But then I, when I listened to one of the seminars on, uh, on the applications of statistics to, uh, to medical data, in particular to studying cardiovascular diseases, then I was uh, really drawn to, to that as, much, as a much more interesting uh, path for, uh, for my career. So I abandoned insurance math and then I I hopped into uh, uh, biostatistics because I thought it was more uh, more challenging and in fact more fun as well. I think I'd agree with you on that. That statistics sound a little bit more fun than insurance. <laughs> yes, uh, definitely. Brilliant story, Paola. What got you excited about statistics to solve problems in science? Well, so I started to work on geospatial statistics and health surveillance when I was doing my PhD. During that time, I collaborated with the Registry of Cancer in Spain, doing a spatial analysis and detecting clusters of different types of cancer. But my background was in mathematics, so I didn't know, I didn't have much knowledge about epidemiology or biostatistics. So I decided to apply for a fellowship to go to Harvard to study a master's in biostatistics. And then I did a research stay at the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control in Sweden. After that, I, I returned to Spain, I finished my PhD, and then I worked at different institutions and universities in the UK, in Australia, and the US in, in a statistical modeling of infectious diseases in low and middle income countries. Um, for me, it's very rewarding to work in this area because I'm able to apply my statistics and mathematics knowledge to real problems. And I'm able to get insights from data and, and these results are useful for decision makers to develop strategies for disease prevention and control, to allocate resources and also to, to improve their life and well-being of the population. Very impressive. Thank you, Bella. And I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head there. Um, you know, statistics are extremely important for real world problems, which is something that I think the whole world has found out this year. David, what got you excited about using statistics? All right. Uh, yeah, um, so I, uh, when I did my master's uh, back a while ago, I did it in engineering mathematics. And I, back then I was quite unaware of statistics and I, intended to continue doing a PhD in mathematics, actually. Uh, but during my master's, I spent one year uh, or one summer at Caltech in the US, where we, uh, I was part of a summer undergraduate research project where we were, uh, had a team and we were supposed to design a self-driving car that was supposed to be participating in a, in a competition for, for self-driving cars. Uh, so in that project, I was uh, in charge of uh, so-called sensor fusion. So basically combining all of the sensor information in this vehicle, so LiDAR and cameras, for instance. And uh, we came up with a solution in the end that had a 
Okay, no, it, it worked quite good and we didn't really use any statistics, but when I was working on it, I was really convinced that there had to be a better way of kind of dealing with all of the uncertainties in this data. Uh, so after this project, I went back to Sweden. I finished my master's by essentially taking all available courses in statistics uh, with the, then the intention of going back to, to work on these self-driving cars. Uh, but when I was taking one course in particular on spatial statistics and on image analysis, uh, I was uh, got fascinated by a particular class of models that had nice computational properties. And uh, uh, there was a project suggestion then when uh, about using these kind of random field models for um, uh, detecting changes in vegetation over the African Sahel, so an environmental science problem. And I actually decided to stay working on that project instead, and uh, I liked it so much that I continued on doing a PhD on these methods, and I haven't really left the field since. Very good. And um, I think, David, you're like a true scientist. You came across a problem, you wanted to solve it, and then you ended up getting into that area. And then I think that just kind of brings about that perhaps there are a lot of challenges when it comes to statistics. Ooh, that word is still rolling around wrong on my tongue. <laughs> um, so what kind of challenges, David, would you um, come across with statistics? Uh... So challenges, well, so the challenges I would say for me personally is, um, uh, so I worked a lot uh, interdisciplinary, as I said, with different, um, you know, different people from different backgrounds, uh, all the way from people in theoretical mathematics, where we collaborate to develop the models to uh, applied scientists, for instance, like architects who have very little knowledge of of statistical methods and st statistical methodology. Uh, and uh, I would say then that yeah, the, the difficult thing is really to communicate and uh, to kind of build up a common language uh, to discuss the questions, the scientific questions, uh, so that we don't run into misunderstandings by caused by our different backgrounds. I would say that this can take a lot of time and this is quite challenging. Yeah, so you're basically you struggled with the like a joint language um, or a way to communicate mm -hmm. and able to discuss the problems between between the fields. Yeah, very good. Um, Hernando, what challenges have you come across with regards to statistics? Because I think it's very similar uh, to what David uh, David described. So for me, uh, one of the challenges is that you're dealing with a very complex biological phenomenon and you want to be able to tell a story about it. And uh, so therefore, because it's a very complex phenomenon, trying to understand how brain regions interact with each other and how these interactions vary, you know, when you're looking at different types of stimuli from auditory to somatosensory to visual and so on. Uh, so you want to be able to characterize um, uh, these interactions and how they differ across many different conditions. Uh, so the first challenge is that how do we build a framework uh, so we can accurately characterize these, uh, uh, the, uh, these processes. And so, so here it's both fun and challenging because you have to talk with your collaborators and then try to understand the theories um, you know, that, um, uh, that are being uh, uh, discussed and therefore build a model that takes into account these known biological, um, bi uh, biological findings uh, and also biological uh, empirical evidence. So the first is that of characterization. And the second one is that of, you know, once you have a, you're looking at a very complex process and therefore you have, you need to have a complex uh, statistical model to describe that complex process, then comes a problem of computation. Uh, so that's another, another big here. I think all of us here in this panel uh, deal with that uh, uh, issue. And in fact, for, for our program in statistics, we have identified computational statistics as one of the key co core area of modern statistics. And, you know, we're hiring uh, in that uh, along those lines, and so that's uh, so that's 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 key to really uh, delving into um, into modern types of data, high dimensional, massive massive data um, derived from complex processes. So to me, those are the most uh, uh, the, the crucial challenges that I usually face. 
I can imagine that you do have an awesome amount of data as well. You know, you said that you you take these time series, which is just um, perhaps a, a biological or a physiological output. And I mean, I can't imagine that they happen every minute. They must happen every millisecond, nanosecond or something like this. So you must just have reams of data. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so for uh, for some um, for some animal data, we have uh, recordings of up to six hours and they can be up to 120 gigabytes just for one uh, non-human animal. So in an experiment, you have you know, dozens of these. And, um, and then of course, with brain signals, there's a lot of noise. So uh, uh, there, there's signal present, but then it's often really um, loaded with lots and lots of, lots and lots of noise. So that's, you know, that's, another, uh, that's another challenge that we have to face with now. Yeah, sounds interesting. Paula, what challenges do you come across? And I'm going to start saying stats now, when it comes to stats. Well, so in my area, in geospatial statistics, for health surveillance, we have access to a vast amount of data. We can work with data from disease registries, from surveys. We can assess the relationship between health events and climatic and environmental variables. We have access to digital data sources. So it's great that we have a lot of information, but we need to be aware about the limitations and biases in the data. For example, if we work on methods for the early detection of disease outbreaks, we may use data from traditional surveillance systems. But these data have limitations because the information is delayed. From the time that the person gets sick, to the time that the person decides to go to the doctor, go to the doctor, have the laboratory tests, and that information is in the system, it may take a few weeks. So this information is not useful for taking action in real time. Nowadays, we have access to other types of data, such as social media posts, where people chat about how they feel, or Google searches, where people search about treatments for their conditions. Um, this information is not produced, for epidemiological research, but we can use it to understand disease activity levels in real time. But again, these also have a lot of limitations because not everybody uses social media platforms. Internet penetration is different in different places. So it's very important that we develop new methods that are able to integrate data at different spatial and spatial temporal resolutions and from different sources taking into account all of the uncertainties in order to obtain valid inferences. Wow, and so I assume then when you're looking into public data, like, you know, from social media channels, that's all private to a point, right? I mean, you don't know the individual where it comes from, but you can pull it out of that social media channel. Yes, yeah, so sometimes we work with confidentiality data, maybe we don't know the, the exact coordinates, but we know that are belong to a, a municipality, for example, and we work with anonymized data. Wow, very interesting. Paolo, you seem really um, passionate about what you do. So I'm going to ask you, what motivated you to apply, to apply stats in the way that you do? Well, the thing is, um, what motivates me is that um, I'm able to apply my statistics knowledge to solve real problems and the outputs of my research are useful and, 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 are, um, and have an impact on the population. For example, I, I worked on a project studying leptospirosis in Brazil. This is a disease transmitted by the urine of the rats or an environment that is contaminated by the urine of the rats. And it's very common in urban slum communities because the rapid um, growth of these communities that creates ecological conditions for rat borne transmission. So in this study, we recruited a number of people and followed them for several years. And each year we um, collected information about disease and also environmental sociodemographic factors. And at the end of the study, we were able to create maps identifying high risk areas that were useful for policymakers to allocate resources in areas of greatest need. And we also 
learn more about risk factors such as being in contact with mud and water that could be contaminated. And all of this information were very useful. There were campaigns to educate people about the disease and its causes, so they could modify their behaviors and, 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 and uh, avoided getting infected. And all of this, uh, at the end, uh, what, uh, what produced was that uh, the burden of leptospirosis decreased in, in this community. So I'm very happy to see that, uh, like, what we are doing is useful for, for the population. I'm sure you are. That's very impressive. And it's, as you said earlier, it's quite rewarding. It does sound rewarding. Um, and having your research have such an impact in the society as well, that it changed then how they behave, that, that's brilliant. Um, Hernando, maybe we can ask you the same question. What mo motivated you to apply stats in the way that you do? Yeah, I, I really, um, um, I. I like uh, the adventures of statistics uh, when you when you take it into medical medical science and in particular uh, to brain imaging to neuroscience understanding uh, how how the brain works and so when I was at Brown I had an opportunity to collaborate with psychiatrists um, studying OCD and uh, so it was quite fascinating because we study different species of um, 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 uh, of um, of animals and uh, try to understand um, um, uh, what um, uh, uh, what are the neuro neurological uh, um, underpinnings of, of this particular of this particular disease? When I was at UC Irvine, I collaborated with neurologists who were looking at uh, the impact of um, um, of stroke on on eventual uh, motor uh, uh, eventual brain function. Um, so we we looked at and then we also looked at in fact how different brain connectivity structures. At the beginning of treatment, how that may predict how a person will respond to different types of stroke therapies. Uh, so, to me as a statistician, uh, I know that I enjoy working with numbers, working with um, uh, working with models, and but be able to apply it to real life data and see that my work may have an impact, uh, maybe if not immediately realized in the future, uh, on how to uh, to treat different types of diseases. Brilliant. Thank you, Hernando. I just want to also remind our audience that they can ask questions at any time. So please do get your questions ready and send them in. Um, it sounds like statistics is just, it's its kind of a different side cafe that we've done um, to the ones we've done before, because we're usually kind of focused in on uh, faculty and researchers that are working on a similar topic, um, but they're very specific in one area. And it just sounds like with statistics, you can do you can use statistics on absolutely everything in the world. Um, so you are kind of, you know, bringing me over to the dark side. I am finding statistics quite interesting now. <laughs> um, David, same question to you. What motivated you to apply stats in the way that you do? And I think there's a boat story in here somewhere. <laughs> You'll have to tell our audience more. <laughs> No, so, I mean, exactly as you said, I think to me, the beauty of statistics is that really the same class of statistical methods often turn out to be useful for many different problems. Uh, so personally, I don't really have one specific field of application, but I work in many different areas. Uh, so during the last year, I worked in uh, brain imaging and in urban science, in porous material modeling and uh, ocean wave modeling, which is the boat story. Uh, and uh, to me, when, when deciding if I should work on a project, uh, I, mean, I always ask myself then, first of all, is it scientifically interesting and would it have kind of an impact? Uh, but to me, I also want to know if it's interesting from a statistical point of view. So my favorite projects are those where there's an interesting scientific question that requires development of new statistical methodology. Uh, and uh, yes, the, the, the boat story is one such problem where uh, this was last year we worked on modeling of ocean waves or the statistical distribution of ocean waves. And the scientific problem here was that uh, we wanted to develop a method for predicting damages uh, that container ships can obtain if they, for instance, travel from, say, London to New York. Uh, and this type of damage then that is, so the damage specifically then that is obtained when 
waves are hitting the ships. So this type of damage is called fatigue damage and it's caused then by, by vibrations that are induced by the ocean waves. Uh, and the ability to predict this fatigue damage is useful, for instance, for can be used for route planning uh, or for estimation when ships need uh, maintenance. Uh, and there are formulas for essentially predicting these damages uh, if you know kind of what type of boat it is and if you know the how the distribution of ocean waves is changing over the over the route. Uh, so the, this is what we did then. We wanted to model the, how is the distribution of ocean waves changing over, say, over seasons and over different locations, say, over the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and it turned out that this required then a new type of statistical random field models, uh, which turned out to work very well for this purpose. And uh, in fact, uh, a former PhD student of mine who, who worked on this project, he was uh, recruited to a marine science department where they're now trying to turn these methods into real practical tools for uh, improving decision making in marine operations. Excellent, that is brilliant. So um, we've, we've received a few uh, questions in from the audience, which I'm going to read off my phone and just Feel free to answer. Um, so the first question is, if we use statistical models to project the outcomes of things, um, if so, how robust and accurate are they? Any takers for the answer to that question? Fernando, unmute yourself. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I can give it a, a shot, yeah. So uh, statistics actually is used for forecasting and for prediction. And so, you know, we, we study um, um, the proce uh, processes, we have current data at hand, and um, uh, based on the current data, we try to study patterns, we try to study uh, some mean structures, some variations in the patterns in the data, and then uh, we want to predict or forecast something for tomorrow. I think that's what the, 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 uh, the questioner, you know, the, the, the audience is, uh, uh, is asking. Of course, in statistics, then we can make a forecast about uh, about tomorrow or about another location. Um, and uh, when we make these kinds of forecasts, then we also attach to that some level of uncertainty about our forecast. So we have different models uh, where we can um, produce a point forecast as well as some some interval that tells us um, how certain we are about about our forecast. You know, so if I was to predict about the um, the temperature. In, in Jeddah tomorrow, uh, then uh, because of the fact that here in Saudi Arabia, temperature in this area, it's more or less very regular. So there's gonna be a very small level of uncertainty uh, with, with regards to predicting Jeddah temperature tomorrow. And if I was, let's say, in a place like the United States, and I was um, uh, sort of in between, um, uh, in between um, um, uh, spring and summer, um, then that's gonna be a very turbulent um, a time of the year where who knows tomorrow is going to be very hot or it could be still be cool, you know? So, um, so now you attach your uh, levels of certainty or uncertainty about your predictions. So statistics takes care of, um, uh, of, uh, of these things. And so, you know, the, the, the question though is, you know, if um, uh, you have to study these point forecasts as well as well as um, your uncertainty attached to these forecasts on a case by case basis, depending on what phenomenon you're actually, uh, you're looking at. Thank you, Hernando. So the second question is, how much data is too much and how little data is too little to answer a scientific question with stats? Ooh, that's a question. <laughs> Any takers for that one? David, Paola, David? Well, so sure, I mean, uh, well, of course, I think that is an impossible question <laughs> to, ask, to answer, uh, but I think what is, important that statistics can do is actually to to or to answer that question for a specific um, problem so i mean this is something that i think is one of the more important things about statistics is that we can uh, basically use it to describe uh, uh, what type of questions might we be able to answer with the given data that we have so and this is often something that I have come across when scientists come to me with, with data and some scientific problem and they ask uh, which statistical method should I use to, to answer this question and the, the answer might as very well be that well you have the wrong data or there is too, too little information in this data. So yeah, I think this is uh, well, of course 
there's difficult to give a general answer, but uh, for, for specific problems, we can use statistical methods to, to at least argue about that. Thank you, David. I can add something unless Paula wants to add something to what David has, has said. Um, so, uh, well, what I wanted to add, you know, was um, suppose, for example, you're, you're looking at uh, two different drug treatments. Uh, you have the, the current standard treatment and then one that's being proposed by, you know, by, some, uh, by some clinicians. And uh, now, if for some reason the difference between these two uh, drug treatments are very small when it comes to measuring a particular outcome, then in this case, you would need to have a lot of data to be able to detect these very small, very small differences. Um, however, if the true differences are already quite large to begin with, the variation in the responses are quite small relative to the, you know, to that discrepancy between the mean responses. Then you will not need so much data to be able to detect those uh, those uh, uh, differences. So this is in the area of uh, power analysis and sample size uh, sample size calculation. Of course, you know the more data, uh, 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 the the better because we're able to extract uh, similar information from these different different data points. But the, the reality is we're also governed by some practical issues. So when it comes to brain imaging, you wanna be able to image as many subjects as possible, but it costs you know, in the thousands of dollars per, per individual. And uh, so therefore one has to be very careful about, uh, about these uh, sample, size, uh, sample size projections that you only really will uh, try to scan uh, whatever you think is just necessary to be able to capture differences that you Know that you're trying to test. Yeah, interesting. Thank you, Hernando. So we have one more question. Um, perhaps uh, maybe it's from a master's student or a PhD student, who knows, but definitely someone thinking about the future. Okay, it says, for anyone who's considering getting into statistics, what would you say to inspire them to pursue this interest? I would say watch the Sci Cafe, but yeah, <laughs> what would you guys say to inspire them to pursue this interest? Anything, Paula? You seem very passionate about what you do. Well, I, I think like the first thing is that you need to like like statistics, mathematics, but also if you have a passion but for another discipline, I don't know, sports, finance, health. Uh, if you study statistics, uh, you can always apply what you learn in, in your statistics program in that field so and it's like that's great because you are able like to to have the tools to to solve problems in the field you are interested in yeah it does sound like that you can use stats with anything um hernando do you have anything to add to that yes i do um so i, I think paula's right about uh being passionate you know about um, about about a a very important sociological issue or scientific problem. I think passion is very important in statistics. So in my, in my own experience with my own students um, is that the, um, um, the most successful statistician is not exactly the one who can prove the most number of theorems. It's really the one who is passionate about a particular problem and they will work on it day and night. They will not count the hours because it's their interest or passion that drives them. Uh, so that's one level of, uh, you know, of, um, of the equation here. The other, is out of preparedness. Um, so our program at Kaos in particular, I would say that we're one of the uh, really quite uh, rigorous when it comes to um, uh, having these, uh, in, in terms of our background for, uh, for, for courses. So in many other uh, places in the US, you would take about one or two years of preparation before you take the qualifying exams. At Kaos, you only have four and a half months, one semester. You take all the core courses, take the qualifying exam. You know, so it's quite it's quite challenging. That's why it's important for our students when they come that they're ready on day zero. You know, so we we give them skills tests so that uh, to, to to see their level of preparedness in mathematics, in statistics, probability. Um, uh, so these are the you know the 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 the, the core courses and yeah. So being passionate about uh, about uh, working on a problem and at the same time having the the proper background and training so that you, know, you come to the program, you're ready on day zero. Thank you, Hernando. And I have um, a specific question here for David, um, and I think it'd be our last question, but 
It says, I am one of those people who have shifted from pure mathematics to the world of statistics. I did that after doing a mathematics for an undergraduate studies and applied math or their masters. My question is, what are the essential knowledge that a student with a similar background needs to proceed and overcome the challenges in the stats research field? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, I, I think coming from that background, I think it's at least in, in my kind of specific area in statistics, I think this is really ideal that you, as Sanando was saying that you, if you're coming from that, that area, you have a strong mathematics background. So probably the, the thing that you need to, uh, to prepare more or learn more about is the more kind of data analysis, that data science uh, aspect of statistics, which is not present in, in applied math usually. So, but uh, I mean, in my, in my experience, at least, I think this is uh, usually, uh, yeah, it's, it, is something you can overcome <laughs> if you have a strong mathematics background. So I would not be too worried about that. Brilliant, David, thank you. We're almost kind of getting into like a career seminar talk here. <laughs> so I'll leave it with that. Um, if there's anything more that any of you would like to say before we close. No, you've all been brilliant. Um, thank you so much. You've definitely opened my mind. Uh, the use of statistics for solutions in science is extremely interesting and uh, very important, so it seems, and you all do um, wonderful things for this university and also for the world. Um, I never thought I'd put statistics and interesting in the same sentence, <laughs> no offence, <laughs> but again, you've swayed me. Um, so for our listeners, if you want to learn more about KAIS research, you can go to discovery.kais.edu.sa and you can even sign up for our bi-weekly newsletters. Um, our newest edition of KAIS Discovery is also online and um, you can revisit older Sci cafes uh, when we were once in front of a live audience back in the day, pre-COVID times, on uh, KAIS official YouTube and Facebook. So thank you very much for listening and goodbye. Bye-bye.